And we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first ever Best Phone Plans podcast. This is a brand new show where we talk about cell phone plans, features, prepaid and postpaid, and the latest news in telecom and wireless. I'm Stetson, and with me today is co-host Dennis. Uh, Dennis, you want to take a moment to introduce yourself, uh, talk about what you're interested in and how you got into wireless. Absolutely. Thank you, Stetson. So... Hi guys, my name's Dennis. You might recognize me a little bit from the chat. Um, basically, I am a avid tech enthusiast across the board. Uh, I got into wireless uh, simply because I grew up in a rural area that had poor uh, broadband. So it got me into an explorative state just to solve my own personal problems. And eventually I just ended up having a passion for telecommunications and all the fun, interesting stuff. Um, and yeah, Stetson, what do you want to That's, talk about now? Well, I guess I got into cell phone plans and wireless basically because, you know, I was a kid in high school and I had actually the iPhone 5, right? So really old phone. And I had a cheap T-Mobile talk and text plan, but no cellular data. So that means all my friends who had smartphones had cellular data and I did not have cellular data. And worst of all, my school did not offer public Wi-Fi. So this sent me on a mission to find the most affordable data plan for my needs. And I looked at the big four carriers, realized they were super expensive, was like, hey, I wonder what else is out there. And that's where I started doing research into uh, these smaller carriers like Cricket um, and the other MVNOs available with more affordable plans. So like back then they were kind of expensive, right? So I think I ended up going with Cricket and it was 35 bucks a month for i think just two gigs but you know we've gradually seen all of these plans come down in price and from there i realized you know basically we have this landscape where there's a lot of uh kind of well there's actually not a lot of information and so i combined my passion for video creating with my interest in this new subject area where i just wanted to teach and show people like hey here's how you sign up for this carrier. Here's what the experience and features are like. And so I actually started testing out and reviewing plans. And that's that's kind of how I got into wireless and you know what, how I got started in this pretty great niche, to be honest with you, uh, right? And yeah, that's that's kind of what I have for that. That's the, that's the brief intro. I think what we should do now is kind of dive into some news, right? So uh, what did we hear from T-Mobile today, Dennis? So T-Mobile just announced that they're going to be doing a standalone hotspot plan for $50 per month, and you'll get 100 gigabytes of full LTE speed data, which is super um, exciting. Um, honestly, I think this is going to be great for people that do like a lot of travel, um, like right. years. Um, and it could even possibly be like a home broadband substitute, which is going to be really important. Uh, for people dealing with the pandemic right now, you know, a lot of Americans don't have access to a fixed uh, home solution. So this might be that little call to action for them so they can do their schooling online and different things like that. It's definitely really exciting. The timing of this announcement was great. And yeah, the other rates, we have 30 bucks for 10 gigs, 40 bucks for 30 gigs of cellular data, and then $50 for 100 gigabytes, uh, which T-Mobile, they had a press release. I think it's, it should be linked in the show notes. And you can actually see it compares really, really well. It actually obliterates, destroys the options from Verizon to AT&T. Uh, the same $50 gets you just five gigs on Verizon and only 15 gigs on AT&T. Because of course, uh, we had AT&T pull the plug on their tablet plan. Uh, right, Dennis, you were telling me, uh, talking to me about this, I think yesterday, the day before, where there was actually, what was it, a tablet data plan that people were using as their home internet? What was going on there? Yeah, so AT&T had this unlimited plan and people would get it as a tablet line. And then what they would do is they would take the SIM card out from that tablet line and basically put it into like this weird little router that had its own little SIM card slot and use it for their home internet. So they had like a router, just like you're kind of picturing with like little antennas and they would be running off of at and cell network, which as you've seen from your testing and some of the posts that I put in the discord, you know, you're getting very usable speeds, 100 megabits per second plus, um, which is more than great to stream 4k game on and so forth. But 
AT&T really started cracking down on that. They, they, they've been trying to get people off those grandfathered plans with the new tablet lines and their elite mix and match. They've really started to limit like video and they've also put measures in place to make sure that you're actually having the SIM card active in a tablet based off the eye in the eye of the device. So they've really been cracking down on that. I think, uh, do you think this was due to like network management and congestion? Like, were they trying to free up bandwidth or was it just like, Hey, we need to get these people who are abusing the network off. I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's about network abuse because if you think about it, if someone's using the internet in that fashion to replace their home internet, they're going to be using significantly more data than your average user. I'm talking like 200, 300 gigabytes of data easy per yeah, month. Shout out, shout out to Apple Watts, the 700 gigs of data per month. I mean, that's a tremendous amount of data, my friend. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, Dennis, as you were saying, if you have these uh, higher data users, they are kind of sucking up network bandwidth and i think at&t did want to just like give them the boot yeah that or they they're probably going to come around and figure out a way to get more revenue out of them if anything right because those tablet lines were very cheap i think it was only like 30 dollars to have that line and if you're that kind of user i'm sure at&t wants to get their pound of flesh so to speak <laughs> <laughs> there were repercussions for this for other carriers as well so i actually did a review of wing and their wing AT&T was basically the same plan that AT&T themselves was offering. And sort of around the same time that AT&T, you know, stopped their hotspot option, they also went ahead and capped wings plan to 30 gigs. That was huge, right? I know a lot of people were upset about that. Not necessarily wings fault, but just AT&T spontaneously changed their agreement they had with wing. And we actually saw something similar with Boom Mobile. Boom Mobile is another retailer of AT&T business plans. They had that postpaid priority that everyone loves. And unfortunately, when AT&T made these changes, it looked like Boom was not affected. However, now if you go onto Boom's website and you're looking at the plans, uh, the language does indicate that you get 22 gigs of guaranteed priority data, and then the speeds either may slow down or may even shut off. So that's kind of unfortunate to see, but it is to Dennis, as you were saying, AT&T's benefit to try and find ways to uh, either bring these customers on as higher paying customers for their data plans um, or uh, for those customers to kind of free up a lot of the network bandwidth. And yeah, go ahead. And I was just going to say at the end of the day, I mean, honestly, the fact that AT&T was laying that go on to begin with was sort of an anomaly. Uh, I think it's really just becoming more in line with what Verizon and T-Mobile have traditionally been doing anyway to begin with, you know. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, finally, for T-Mobile, they announced a new 5G mobile hotspot device. So if you're interested in picking this up, uh, you can get it. It's the 5G MiFi M2000. Excuse me. It uh, comes in black and it starts at $336. However, you can get this 50% off when you add a line to your T-Mobile account. Um, honestly, if you're adding a line, that could increase the price anymore. So I would probably pick it up full price if you're interested in that. Um, yeah. Quick question for you. Um, yeah. At that price point, do you see this as being a realistically like obtainable, useful option to people? I mean, that's a pretty high barrier to entry for a hotspot, essentially. Well, I think it compares pretty well with the other hotspots that are available, right? It's the, um, it's the M. What is it? The there's a mobile hotspot that is by Netgear, and I think AT&T is the one who primarily sells it. So yeah, it's the Nighthawk M1. So that's actually $315. And I think with T-Mobile, I mean, that's kind of right up there, reasonably priced. Um, but it's going to be better suited for the T-Mobile network and it supports 5G, which the Nighthawk M1 currently does not. I believe uh, Netgear is working on a model that does support 5G, but I think it's going to be in the $500 to $600 price range. Oh, wow. And I'm not sure if it's available in the United States as of yet. It might be only in the UK and the European markets. Wow. I didn't realize hotspots are that expensive. Um, yeah, right. It's great. I mean, <laughs> it's, I guess it's a dedicated device, but it's still, you know, in comparison to phones, it's more expensive than I would have thought. Uh, in comparison, Verizon's 5G hotspot device, the 5G MiFi M1000, that's going for $650. Right. Wow. I mean, so, honestly, honestly, though, I will just say the one thing I would like to see T-Mobile do 
is instead of requiring people to buy these dedicated hotspots, I would really love them to give like an add-on option for their integrated plan. Because I don't know about you, Stetson, but I really don't want to be like I don't want to be carrying around another device, right? Like I already got two phones. I really don't want a third device in my pocket just for use for hotspot. You know. So what are you saying? Would you rather have like a dedicated hotspot plan that doesn't require an active line, or you, do you want to just enable unlimited hotspot in your personal Basic line? Basically, I'm just saying, like, as, let's just say, like, you know, with T-Mobile's one plan, right? I get, I think it's 10 gigs of hotspot included. Yeah. I wish they would give me the option, like, for $10 more, you can bump up your hotspot to 100 gigabytes on that line or whatever whatever amount it is, right? And this way, I can just use my phone, which, you know, is more than capable of handling hotspot to one or two devices, which that's kind of the use case, at least for me, right? Like I'm not going to use hotspot when I'm at home and I got my sweet gigabit internet. I'm going to use it when I'm, you know, maybe at the airport running on a plane, trying to play my Nintendo switch, some Mario Kart or something. I don't know. I hear you on that, Dennis T-Mobile. Interestingly, they do have a, they have a plan add on, right? That actually apparently will give you unlimited hotspot data. So let me try and pull this up right now. I almost want to try it and just see if it's, legit like if it's actually true what they say um but the Is plan the international one that you're yeah about? yeah it's the international yeah. one i think i brought it up on another live stream but it's very expensive i think it's 50 bucks a month right and apparently it does offer that unlimited hotspot capability so i mean is that worth it over what the other plans is here it is it's global plus 15 gigs for 50 bucks a month so you're getting 15 gigs of international data and then apparently unlimited high speed mobile hotspot data while within the US. Well, I mean, you said it's a 50 bucks add on. So you're getting unlimited versus 100 gigs and you're getting. Oh, 50. shoot. You know, that's that's better value. Wait, 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 all right. Wait a minute. Let's think about this a little bit more. And if you have a 5G phone, right? So, Dennis, you just picked up the iPhone 12, 12 Pro, Pro Max. Max. And yep. what else do you have? You have the S20. That's 5G, right? Yeah, S20 plus 5G, so it supports middle mover wave and everything else too. Yep. So you can not only get unlimited data, but this would be, if you had it, 5G data, if you had 5G coverage in your area, and it's unlimited, and you can share that 5G connection with your 5G phone. So you're getting faster speed. Uh, for my testing, slower speeds, but in maybe other markets where uh, T-Mobile has their ultra wideband, actually, I think they're calling it ultra capacity is what they're calling it their ultra capacity 5g network uh you can share that for some super fast speeds and what's even funnier is is if you would have got in when the getting was good back in the team one one days um it was whatever was past one plus i can't remember what they called i think it was just called one plus international it used to only be 25 bucks difference to have that unlimited hotspot so for those people that are grandfathered in right now they're probably so happy as we speak um but yeah honestly it's better value in my opinion like i like, I think this is really cool, but I still think that that international add-on, for example, is way better value, you know, because yeah. you're getting more out of it. Um, I think if I were to make a video on it, that's something I would need to take into consideration. And the other big thing is with these hotspot devices, I believe they're tailored to specifically work with the network that's selling them. Right. So you're getting like a T-Mobile logo. You're only getting the T-Mobile 5G bands. And that's kind of disappointing. I think the Netgear Nighthawk M1, and I think it's like the M5, I want to say, that supports 5G. Um, but whatever that one is, I think it will work with the GSM or the formerly GSM carrier. So I think it's designed for AT&T and T-Mobile, I want to say. Uh, but yeah, that is kind of unfortunate with these devices that they're network specific, whereas your phone, you can take it with any network. And that's a, and that's another big issue, right? You're sinking in 300 bucks, 600 bucks, whatever the figure, but it's basically a paperweight if you decide to leave T-Mobile. You can't just bring it over to someone else, which is also, again, it affects the value proposition of that, right? And also worth mentioning too is if if T-Mobile ends up adding future like bands, say they perform the C option or something to get more spectrum, right? Um, you're going to have to replace that whole hotspot like all on its own, which is another three hundred six hundred dollar investment. Oh yeah, because it doesn't have the bands, right? Versus just buying like a new phone, which again gives you like you're gonna get more use out of the new phone aside from like the extra band support, right? So it's a very specific type of tool for a specific type of job. It definitely has its place, 
Um, but I sort of question the value proposition just ever so slightly. Yeah, I think, you know, you have kind of two different scenarios here. Let's say if you're maybe in an RV, I feel like that's a more realistic scenario. I can definitely understand the convenience of having a dedicated hotspot device. You know, you're using your phone, you don't want to have to put it down or have it plugged in at all times in order to power your wireless connectivity for all the devices in your RV. Uh, But at the same time, like, maybe it's better to just pick up another phone, right? And use that as the dedicated hotspot, throw in that unlimited hotspot add-on and you're cruising. And you can pick up, I want to say, the Galaxy S20. I think I looked, I was interested in potentially selling mine and it was going for around 750, I want to say, for the S20 plus 5G on Swappa. So yeah, you know, I think the value proposition here is both Excellent if you compare it to the hotspot plans available from Verizon, AT&T right now, but also confusing if you think about the other options for kind of sharing your mobile data specifically with T-Mobile. So I think that's a good ending point for the T-Mobile hotspot plans. Be curious to hear everyone else's thoughts on them. Uh, Now let's segue into sort of the main topic for this show, which is eSIM. The reason I wanted to talk about eSIM and why I'm super excited about it is because Mint Mobile officially launched eSIM support and Visible also officially launched eSIM support. So you can now activate your device via eSIM on these carriers. This is pretty huge news, but before we get too deep into it, what is eSIM? Dennis, do you have like a good explanation for us of what eSIM is and why we should at least be aware of it as consumers? Sure. So eSIM is basically it stands for embedded sim so it's a tiny little chip built into the phone that does all the functionality that your little sim card does and it's a fraction of the size so from a physical standpoint it's going to give device manufacturers more space to do other things whether it's increasing battery larger sensors whatever but the other part that's going to make it super exciting at least if the implementation is done correctly is that switching from carrier to carrier is going to become a lot easier, um, which we can see this with like Visible's implementation, right? You scan a QR code, boom, you have your active SIM line. You know, you go to another country, boom, you can activate the international plan. It's like a very easy, painless process. You're not having to take off the case. You don't have to find a little tool to remove the SIM tray. Like it's supposed to be easier. Um, And I think it's going to do a lot of good for anybody that likes to travel. Like it has the potential, um, especially since it's also adding dual SIM, um, capabilities as well to a lot of U.S. made phones, which I know is common internationally, but that's also going to be huge for us domestically. Yeah, I think it's a great feature to have, uh, but unfortunately in the U.S. it really hasn't taken off as quickly as I was hoping, right? So uh, what carriers do we have that supports it? I think Verizon post-paid supports eSIM. I'm I'm about 90% sure about that. You know, actually, I don't think I've ever checked. I just sort of assumed. Dennis, do you know? Do you know? Do, does anyone know if that's true? Um, I can, I want to, I like, I want to say yes. All right. I'm Dennis, please double check that. Uh, I do know for a fact, AT&T does support eSIM and even AT&T prepaid will support eSIM. Although my understanding is you need to activate the prepaid line first, and then you go to a AT&T store. You can actually purchase an eSIM card. You can call the AT&T porting department and then have them switch the line over to eSIM. I think that's almost... It's almost worth doing a video on that if people are interested, but I think there are some pretty good Reddit posts on the matter. And finally, T-Mobile supports eSIM with both their postpaid lines and their prepaid lines. This is actually really cool. I'm not sure if it's on Android, but I know for a fact on iOS, T-Mobile has a a T-Mobile prepaid app and you can actually activate uh, a new line on the eSIM on your phone, but uh, directly with the app, which is pretty cool. I think... I feel like there's another caveat with that. You may need to either like bring your own number. I'll have to check, but uh, that's also something I was interested in taking a look at. And just to confirm, Verizon does support eSIM. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm seeing, yep, but only on postpaid. That's awesome. Uh, the other carriers that I found that support it is Wing. They resell AT&T business lines and they do support eSIM. You can do an eSIM activation with AT&T. Uh, it is important to note Wing currently has a 50 gigabyte limit with their postpaid AT&T plans. Boom Mobile, uh, basically the same kind of deal. They're reselling AT&T postpaid. Uh, I don't know. We don't know for sure what the limit is, but uh, you can activate on eSIM if you wish. And another recent announcement is US Mobile is now supporting eSIM, but only for international data roaming. 
Um, so if you want to use eSIM on US Mobile, you can basically add an international data plan to your eSIM, but you can't use it for voice or calling. So uh, this from here, I feel like there's so much to talk about with eSIM and I'm super excited to get into it. Uh, where do you want to start? Like uh, the implications of eSIM or, or maybe dual SIM? I feel like that's probably going to be one of the more common use cases. I feel like we should focus on dual SIM. Okay. Um, and from a from a dual SIM standpoint, at least here in the US, I don't actually think it's all too common for people to use it. If unless you're like a business person that has like a secondary line, or you're someone like us that's just super nerdy. Um, however, where dual SIM comes in really handy is for travel. Um, like Stetson, you've you've been to a few different countries, right? Yeah. So I actually did, uh, you know, best international plans video. And when I did it, I was comparing the international add-ons from Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. And, you know, as we just talked about with T-Mobile's international add-on, it was $50 for that uh, one add-on. I think with T-Mobile, it was like they had a $70 add-on, or excuse me, I think with AT&T, actually AT&T, I think was like $10 a day. And I think Verizon was the one with the $70 add-on. Uh, so what is, what is eSIM doing for international users? Right. So basically what it's letting people do is instead of paying those really expensive like add-ons for like domestic roaming where you're not even getting like priority data in these countries, what you can do is just activate with um, like the native carrier in, the, in like the country that you're visiting. So like, for example, if you went to the UK, you know, you could get uh, your secondary SIM activated with say E, right? Um, or Vodafone. Right. These are domestic carriers to those specific countries. Now you're getting all the perks of priority data. You get to make calls now there, too, when you're like trying to say maybe get an Uber. Right. Um, right. Instead of having to pay like 10 cents or whatever it is per minute. Um, it's just a lot more cost effective and especially useful whenever you're staying for an extended period of times. Um, all the while, though, um, you still got your main SIM card in there so that if you do need to talk to someone back home. Right. Um, you could say use your secondary sims data to maybe use like a a face messenger call or maybe do Wi-Fi calling, right? Maybe turn yeah, hotspot on. I think wait, isn't that so yeah, what's the hack there? What do you do for that scenario? For the Wi-Fi calling portion of yeah. basically, um you would just want to set up your phone, like basically you'd want to set it up so that like your phone's running in hotspot off of the domestic or the the like, eSIM uh, plan, right? The eSIM plan, and then placed your call using Wi-Fi calling. And then that, that way crazy. you're not roaming on, or that way you're not placing like an international call and you're not getting charged and, you know, it's all beautiful and great. Um, texting obviously doesn't matter because most plans, generally speaking nowadays, from T-Mobile and the like, have, you know, unlimited texting abroad in so many countries. Um, yeah, so, but, all right, here's my question for you, Dennis. We, we talked about eSIM and dual SIM where you can have your main number on your physical SIM card, and then use eSIM when traveling internationally. Uh, but you can also use eSIM with some plans in the US. So would you put your main phone number on eSIM? Or would you keep your main number on a physical SIM? What do you think is better right now? That is a really good question. I mean, the idea would be having your main number on the eSIM that way you have your SIM tray open for when you're traveling because a lot of places still don't support eSIM. However, me personally, because I upgrade so frequently and I know just how convoluted it is to transfer numbers from eSIM to like eSIM phone and all that fun stuff, I would personally keep my main number on my SIM card and then just do try to find a company that's international that supports eSIM and do it that way for me personally. Yeah, I think, you know, I've kind of gone back and forth on this because what I like is if you're traveling internationally, you can actually pick up instead of doing uh, an eSIM plan from there. I don't think a lot of the local carriers or I actually don't know if the local carriers support it, but uh, the the plans I've seen have been from like US Mobile, right, where they have their eSIM plans. Um, Aerolu is another one. And I think Air.net, I think, is another eSIM plan. Like you can look these up, but you can get eSIM data only plans, which is optimal for international traveling, like usually reasonable rates. And because it's via eSIM, it's super easy. You don't have to go to a physical store. Like you don't have to basically land, get to an airport and be like, all right, where's the nearest like Vodafone or O2 store, right? You can just boom, scan your QR code, get activated, ready to go. On the flip side, sometimes the plans from Vodafone, from O2, from those local 
carriers in the country you're visiting are often a lot better uh, than what you can typically find uh, from the eSIM plans, I believe. So I think personally right now, I would say I would keep my physical or I would keep my personal number on my physical SIM card like you, Dennis. I think it's just a better experience and it gives me the flexibility to kind of sw swap phones, do whatever I need. And, you know, I feel like if you're traveling internationally, maybe the move is just to have a second phone where you can either activate it on eSIM or you can get a physical SIM card depending on the duration of your stay and what works better for you. Or alternatively, too, I mean, those U.S. mobile plans that you were showcasing with the international data where it activates when you touch down. Yeah, that is a very good option. And the pricing wasn't like that outrageous. Right. It's like so a... reasonable. And I feel like with that experience, you're just getting something that's seamless. It's easy. And that's I feel like what people are looking for when they're traveling abroad, like they don't want to have to think about it so much. Right. You're already stressing about all the packages. You're stressing about catching the plane. You're stressing about like you're you're stressing about so many things you really don't have to want to like have to worry about just one other thing, right? Like you want everything to be smooth, everything just to work and just be done with it. So uh definitely, 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 definitely understand that. Um here's a here's a topic though, since you brought it up. Um, what do you think the best phone is to use for when you travel? That's a great question. I think iPhones are actually pretty well known for their excellent international support. So I think I would go iPhone. Um, I also want to say a Samsung phone, but I'm not sure. And I may be a Google Pixel phone. I don't know. What's your, am I in the right ballpark there? What's your take? Definitely. So, um, if you have to go Apple, I mean, iPhone is great. It supports the most bands, generally speaking. Uh, Apple generally only makes like one or two models every year. So you have good confidence knowing that you're going to have support for like, especially this year with like CDMA networks if you go to China or GSM based networks. Like you got a good wide variety of band support. However, if you're in the Android camp, uh, I definitely think Google Pixel would be the next best thing because again, they only make like one model. And it's it's going to work pretty much everywhere. And then Samsung would actually be third for me um, as far as like actual like coverage and supports concerned. Um, and it would go in that order. Um, so if you were someone that travels a lot, it goes iPhone if you're an Apple user or if you want Android, Google Pixel. And the reason why I lean on Pixel first is because it's one of the few Android phones that does support eSIM as well. Whereas Samsung, as you know, right now for the US versions, for whatever reason, they have an enabled eSIM support. So it's true. It's crazy. I, I don't understand that at all. I mean, Samsung really dropped the ball on that where I bought the phone because it supported eSIM and like they just they just don't they haven't added the feature. Like, how do you how do you even sell a product, advertise a feature, and then not have it have the feature? I don't know. And it's crazy because in the year, like in every other ver version of the phone all across the EU, they already have it enabled. It's just a simple software update at this point, basically. So. That is mind boggling to me. I will say I feel like Samsung runs into issues where they have to design the software for Verizon. Like they have a Verizon software, then they have a T-Mobile software and then an AT&T software, right? Um, I feel like it's it's like those phones. Like what blows my mind is you can buy a phone and when you power it on, you're hit with a T-Mobile logo right like what why why would i want that like i want to i want to see either the samsung logo or the google logo or the apple logo i don't want to hear or see any carrier branded logos in a phone it just doesn't feel right to me well samsung's came a long way from where they used to be around the time of i want to say the s9 they actually started making it where depending on the sim card you put in the phone is the bootloader that you would get but prior to that if you would have got like an s7 and bought it with Verizon, for example, and then brought it over to like someone like T-Mobile, you'd still be stuck on the Verizon firmware. So things like Wi-Fi calling got a little wonky, you know, different little functionality bits just got weird. Um, so, I mean, Samsung's coming a long way with things. And then as far as why you're seeing the bootloader, it just has to do with how Android started, right? Like Apple took a whole different approach. They controlled everything. Android wanted to be in the hands of the carriers and they kind of give the carriers some freedom to tweak uh, the software a little bit to their, you know, to what they want, right? With the preloaded, you know, bloatware apps, right. like T-Mobile Digits, T-Mobile My Account, T-Mobile Tuesday. Um, 
I mean, it's it's here nor there. I mean, it doesn't personally bother me that much, to be honest. Because I mean, how often are we power cycling our phones? Yeah, yeah, that's true. But I but I definitely do get it. I like the stock clean experience when possible. But right, right. Uh, so I think yeah, we did a great job kind of outlining eSIM use in the U.S. and how we would use it for travel. Uh, do we know if other countries are using eSIM differently or have had a faster adoption rate? Because I feel like in the U.S. it's just been so slow. Like we're just hearing now that two out of hundreds of MVNO carriers are starting to support eSIM. Uh, do we know what the landscape looks like for international countries or how people are using eSIM or du dual SIM in uh, yeah other countries? Don't know too much about it, but I will say that the EU has been faster to adopt it. Like Vodafone, E, like these types of carriers, much quicker to pick it up. And at least in that landscape, they don't seem to have as many um, NVNOs as we do here in the States. Um, it's, it's crazy. It's almost confusing, right? Where all of a sudden you have a hundred different carriers offering almost the same thing. Yeah, it's 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 really weird how we are. It's like not to get too off topic, but it's like the same thing with banks, right? You go to most countries like Canada and they have like five major banks and that's about it, right? You come to the US, you got your big six and then you got all these like thousands of little banks. Like why? Why do they exist? What's their function? What's their point? And the same can kind of be said with like networks, right? Like, yeah, we got the three big carriers and then they got their prepaid brands. And then they got their NVNO brands like AT&T bought Cricket, right? So they have right, AT&T yeah. Cricket and Cricket. And then you got a million other spinoff of NVNO. It's just like, why? Like a lot of them are offering identical pricing. A lot of them aren't doing anything different to make themselves unique. So like, one, how are you surviving as a business? But two, why do you exist? What, what function do you perform? Yeah. But, it's true. It's I, kind of confusing and overwhelming, I would say, for consumers. But at the same time, I think, you know, a lot of people don't really know about the smaller providers because uh, it's really Verizon, AT&T and T-Mobile that are spending the big bucks on the Super Bowl commercials, on the TV ads, on the sponsored spots. So I think, you know, people think of cell phone carriers, there's only like maybe six to 10 that actually pop in their minds, you know, the major carriers, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, and then uh, typically their flanker carriers where Verizon's got uh, visible AT&T as Cricket and T-Mobile as Metro by T-Mobile. I would say those are probably probably the more well-known and most popular ones. And I think this is a pretty good point to kind of transition off of this just slightly on yeah. the question I have for you, sure. which is with all these different options, right? What made you decide to go with Mint Mobile as your primary carrier? And then expanding on that a little bit further, what would it take for you to switch? What would I think, yeah, be? that's a great question. So my plan story, I'd be curious to hear yours too, Dennis, but I started out, right, I was in high school. My very first plan was a T-Mobile $15 unlimited texting plan and 10 cents per minute. That was the plan. And from there, I was like, I need a data plan. And that's when I found Cricket. So I actually ported my number from T-Mobile to Cricket. I was in a Cricket family that I found on Reddit. Shout out to Reddit. <laughs> I love that community. And um, I, yeah, I had cricket, I want to say through most of high school. And then I remember there was a point where AT&T actually had a $10 unlimited talk and text plan. And I think I might have done that either. I can't remember if it was after T-Mobile or if it was like between T-Mobile and cricket or if it was after cricket. But I remember I did switch to that because it was super, super affordable and you're on the AT&T network, which has better coverage. Uh, so that was great. Um, and then I was on Cricket. And then I think I went from Cricket to US Mobile because my my family split up. I remember me the guy messaged me and he was like, hey, uh, Sprint's unlimited. I think they were doing like free unlimited or something absurdly cheap. It was like, yeah, we're going to Sprint. And so they ditched me. And uh, I was like, well, I'm not paying 40 bucks a month or 35 bucks a month on my plan. So I was out and I went to, that's why I went to US Mobile because they had the custom uh, plan so I could build what met my needs. And I was in college at the time. So I had on-campus Wi-Fi, not really going anywhere. Um, and that worked out really well. And then what happened is, you know, I started getting into more of the MVNOs. I did research and Mint Mobile had their Black Friday promotion. And so I was like, well, you know, I, I want to show people this promotion. And I feel like it, it makes the most sense for me just to switch myself to 
the Mint Mobile line. So that's why I did. I ported from US Mobile to Mint Mobile. And that is how I ended up on Mint Mobile. It was one of the cheapest plans that met my needs and had all the features I was used to. Because I think, Dennis, the the problem with a lot of MVNOs, right, is for whatever reason, I don't know what goes on in the back end, the agreements or what even needs to happen to make these features become supported. But a lot of the MVNOs don't actually support features like voice over LTE, Wi-Fi calling. Sometimes you need to enter custom APN settings to get your data group and picture messaging set up to work. And with Mint Mobile, I think ever since iOS, I want to say iOS 12 or yeah, I think 12 sounds right, maybe 11, uh, they made it so your APN settings are automatically configured. They support Wi-Fi calling and voice over LTE. And quite honestly, they were the cheapest plan that supported my needs. And that was, you know, that's my big thing is to find an affordable plan to meet your needs. And it was right around that $15 price point that I was paying for the T-Mobile plan uh, so many years ago. So that's how I ended up on Mint Mobile. What would get me to switch? I think this is a great question. And it kind of leads into what I'm testing right now. So I'm actually currently working on a video comparing the data speeds and priority level on the T-Mobile network. So I'm comparing T-Mobile Magenta Plus versus T-Mobile Essentials, T-Mobile Prepaid, Metro by T-Mobile, and Mint Mobile. And when I'm running these speed tests, I noticed that the priority data on T-Mobile was actually noticeably faster than what I was getting on Mint Mobile, as well as the other deprioritized plans. Uh, so yeah, a little I'll give a little nugget of preview into the video, but I found that surprisingly, T-Mobile Magenta and Magenta Plus have the same priority level as T-Mobile prepaid. However, T-Mobile Essentials is actually deprioritized. It has a lower priority level. Um, and I'm doing a full video on the implications of this, testing out video streaming quality and speeds and performance and all things like that. Um, but yeah, I think for me to switch off of Mint, I would want to get a plan that offered priority data. I would want to get probably on a network with better coverage. So I may actually consider... Uh, either Verizon or at and I mean, honestly, T-Mobile is decent, but um, I'd probably consider that for the better 5G performance. Maybe not now, but maybe in the future. And uh, something with good hotspot data. And that's where T-Mobile themselves really lack. I think Magenta only has 3 gigs, Magenta Plus 20 gigs. Um, and I'd really probably want more depending on my use case. So I think, yeah, if I were to switch off, I'd probably go something with priority data and I'd probably want to make sure I had hotspot support or I was getting some kind of cool perk with my plan. Like uh, uh, Verizon has their Disney Plus, Hulu, ESPN Plus bundle and um, AT&T does HBO Max. So I, I'd probably consider that. I don't know. What's your take? What What do you have now? How did you end up there, Dennis? Sure. So as you know, I have two phones. I have an AT&T line, which is still on my parents' family plan. And then I have my T-Mobile phone, which is the one I pay for and the one that's truly mine. So I'll focus on that one. Um, basically, a long story short, when I was younger, back in like high school, like 10th grade, um, I started using a lot more cell phone data. Uh, I got like an iPhone 5, I think it was, or 6. Did, did your school have Wi-Fi or were you like me, like you had to use your cellular data and you didn't get yeah, they. They had Wi-Fi, but it was like password secured, so the students couldn't connect. So it was pretty much all data. And it was still around this time as well um, at my house. Um, the small regional ISP that we had only gave us like five like megabit per second internet. And, you know, if you wanted to get 50, it was like $300 a month, which we did end up doing that jump eventually. But at that time, I was relying on my cell phone data a lot, basically, to do everything. Schoolwork watch youtube like it was just better right um but anyway my data usage started increasing a lot and our at&t family plan had like six gigs of shared data and i was easily gobbling that up and you know my parents didn't want to pay i think it was 15 dollars for every extra gig of data we use you know that racks up pretty quickly oh it's absurd so basically i end up looking around for my own little cell phone plan and at this time, Unlimited wasn't ubiquitous. Like AT&T and Verizon were still only doing buy the gig plans. So it really only left me with like T-Mobile and Sprint as options. 
and I decided to go down the T-Mobile rabbit hole. I started with a prepaid plan for like one month. Um, their coverage, by the way, back in 2013 was even worse than it is today. <laughs> it, was, um, it was so bad. I remember, I vividly remember being at home and getting like almost no T-Mobile coverage. And then I remember the magic of Band 12 rolling out and upgrading to the iPhone 6S. And that was a game changer for me. Did you have a similar experience or did it get better in your area? What happened? Well, the funny thing is, is that we actually have a tower. Like it's literally less than a half mile away. But that tower had two problems. One, it was still using Edge, which is basically like 2.5G. So terrible. And then two, it never got like upgraded backhaul for like another year or two even when they made it have LTE. So that was my problem. But, but at least when I was at school and in, and a lot of other places that mattered, band two and four LT were available and T-Mobile was great. Like I was getting like a hundred plus megabits per second, like really wild stuff. Right. Cause so few people had T-Mobile in this area. So it was just all day, every day, non-congested. And I got this awesome, simple choice, mobile unlimited plan, which had like Napster included. If you're familiar with Napster. Yeah, I remember that. That was the uh, music streaming platform, right? Y yep. So I so I ended up doing that, and it was great. I was enjoying my unlimited data. Um, and then as time progressed, um, T-Mobile came out with like, the one plans, which when they first rolled out, I was clenching onto my little simple choice plan uh, because they had those day passes that they introduced it for like HD. But eventually, they kind of scrapped that. And I eventually moved on to T-Mobile One Plus, which was perfect. 75 bucks all tax and fees included. It was just like perfect. And I really appreciated some of the other perks that Tima will give. Uh, the international uh, calls and texts to Canada and Mexico, like it's the States was beautiful because I got some uh, close friends of the family that are from Mexico. So it was great being able to call them and not being charged extra. That was beautiful. Um, it was also at around this time when I was getting older, I just started doing more of my international travel. So like when I went to like London, France, Italy, you know, Greece, right? Having the international roaming was great because um, I could still communicate with people at home. Uh, the GoGo Wi-Fi, which was included on the T-Mobile plans, also great for when you're on the plane, right? You get the free, you know, the huge, free plan. Huge, Yeah, so, T-Mobile, I think I gave T-Mobile, they're the number one carrier, uh, along with Google Fi, I would say, for international travel and roaming. So, yeah, I mean, basically, it was like a combination of, like, all these perks and features and the customer service, which is such a good experience for, you know, young version of me, right? Like, if I would have walked into Verizon, which, you know, I did talk to them. I was just curious about if they had anything for someone that, like, something that I was looking for. You know, they're very, like, smart, you know, they look at you, like, I, I don't know if you ever had this experience, Destin, but you walk in and they look at you and they're like, that's just some bro kid, you know, get him out of here. Like he's not going to buy nothing. Right. Like you get that kind of like, sure, look. sure. And so like, when you try to ask like a genuine question, like how much does this cost? You know, Verizon can't tell me what the number is. Like they can't even give me like a ballpark. And it was a very frustrating experience. Like I just, I just ended up walking out and going right across the, cause it's a mall. Verizon yeah, was, the, yeah. Verizon's right here. Sprint's right here. T-Mobile has their little kiosk. Like it's, they're literally all adjacent for sure. And I just walked up to T-Mobile. The guy was super friendly. You know, I didn't have any credit because I was young at the time trying to open up this account. And I remember I just had to show like my ID and pay like a deposit. Like he made the whole process super simple. Didn't make me feel like everything about the experience was great. And I was getting in when the getting was good because I thought unlimited plans were going to go extinct. So that's why I was also trying to get in early before that happened. And that's smart, Dennis. That's really smart. And yeah, just everything about the experience was good. You know, it was just good. And that's why I kind of like stick with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now. As far as what it would take to make me switch, um, I would easily switch in a heartbeat if T-Mobile tried to get me off my T-Mobile One Plus plan. Like, oh, after so you're, this, you're in it because you got grandfathered into that T-Mobile One Plus, right? So, if T-Mobile, after like these next couple of years, when their merger, you know, when they don't have to keep like prices the same, decides to switch it up, uh, I would easily be willing to look at just ditching t-mobile at this point because i've had enough of dealing with growing pains it's been nothing but growing pains like there's been ups and downs you know their network has improved a lot but you've seen from my speed test just how unusable it is for me yeah. um and just the calling issues like basic functionality issues that are just problems that like i just don't want to deal with um would make me go elsewhere especially since now unlimited is ubiquitous from a cost standpoint AT&T has come down. 
Um, same thing with Verizon, right? Like they're not as overpriced as they used to be. So there's not as much incentive for me to specifically stay around if T-Mobile decided like pull the rug from under me. So if I did switch, I would be looking for a again a priority plan, one that gives me lots of benefits. Um, I wouldn't necessarily care about the pricing at this point because I'm not the young version of me anymore. Like I actually have a stable job, so I would just be looking for the best plan, which best performance. Yeah. How do you how do you personally kind of uh, gauge that? Like, do you want just the best of the best? Like when I typically buy a, a smartphone, I love getting the best of best of that. But I'm totally fine, like getting the super cheap Mint Mobile, US Mobile, Visible plan, uh, because I feel like I'm just not doing as much with my service as some other people are. Do you feel like you you're really like able to take advantage of the plans and features, or yeah, what like what's your mindset? Like, do you try and balance the priority features with the price, or do you just go for the best? Um, I generally just like want like the best, like. The way I look at it's like this, right? If I'm going out and getting an iPhone 12 Pro Max, 512 yeah. gig storage, right? $1,500 phone, right? Absolutely. I'm not going to pair it with like straight talk, right? Because that's the whole point. <laughs> that is, like, it's this. funny you say that. That is exactly what I would do. I would do something <laughs> like that. But like, I, I, like, I want to get the full use out of this amazing piece of technology. Like, like if I was to look around today, right? Like in my opinion, the best premium plan that came out in state this multiple times, the best premium plan in my opinion right now is AT&T's unlimited elite plan. 100 gigs of priority data, which is beautiful. 30 gigs of hotspot. HBO Max, a nice bonus. I enjoy the content. You know, the calling to internet, uh, you know, the calling to Canada and Mexico is beautiful. Um, the roaming isn't that great, but now that I travel... Like now that I know what to do when I travel, I I could just buy like a, a SIM card, like a travel SIM card when I'm in a country. So that's not that important. Right. Yeah. You hop pop it on that eSIM. So I mean, like that's the thing. And then coverage, right? Coverage is also really important. Like I care about the places that I use the most, right? I don't care about coverage in Arkansas because I'm never in Arkansas. Like so Verizon could tell me they have it, but if it's not good up here in Pittsburgh, then it doesn't matter to me. Um so that's what I'm looking for. Best performance, best coverage, and really good and really good plan. Because I know that with time, AT and T's network is going to continue to get better, and I'm sure they're going to have some down spots here too. But if I have a good plan and I know that I can keep it, then I know that if I weather the storm, I'll be in you know brighter pastures afterwards, similar to the T-Mobile experience, right? Right, so, right. But that's that's kind of how I would make um, my decision. Which, um, on the topic of AT and T, uh, I have a story to tell you about that. Yeah, tell me more. Actually, wait before you get into that, I just had one follow up. Uh, do you know if when you went into the Verizon store, if you were going to a corporate store or one of the, uh, what are they? Are, I think they're franchise stores. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it was a corporate store. Um, That's interesting. It, yeah, I, I guess. As a pro tip, I would just say like typically, typically the corporate stores are able to provide better experiences. Um, but yeah, Dennis, I'm sorry that your younger self wasn't getting that premium treatment that, you know. Well, you remember, I'm like 16 at the time. So yeah, yeah it's... I, I, I was going to say like, I get it. But, but also the... like, you know, everyone deserves it, it kind of sets a precedent for the brand. Like you walk into a store and you're treated a certain way. That sticks with you. I mean, that's why you're with T-Mobile. And you've, at this point, probably given T-Mobile literally thousands of dollars as opposed to Verizon. Like, they missed out on a customer opportunity there. Fair. This is this is a very fair point. And, I mean, I don't blame Verizon. Like, every company probably has their horror stories, right? But, like, that was the experience I had. And it's a it's a really weird... I don't know how to, like, describe it to you. But, like, if you if you get that look and you get that, like, that nonverbal interaction, you yeah, like that body wrong. language, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe other people in the chat will understand where I'm coming from on that. If they've ever been to somewhere that's like bougie, where where they because the way you dress, you might not look like you belong, but you actually got like a couple k in your pocket, right? Like there are people that are like that. They just judge you on first glance. But but anywho, um, yeah, you had a story. Was it this is your AT and T story? Yeah, I I want to talk to talk to you about my AT and T story because it relates back to our main topic of the show, which is e yeah, yeah. Um, so AT and T, the I so okay. Let me let me tell you how the story went. 
I wanted to go down to an AT&T store originally because we had this tablet line that got added. You know, my dad kind of got tricked, free tablet, but they didn't tell oh him it's like God. 20 bucks. That is you my know. grandfather too. He was like in the Verizon store, Verizon, yeah, free tablet. And the poor guy didn't understand anything. And what happened with him is like a $10 a month charge. Is that something similar happened to you? Yeah, exactly. Like I got, my dad got me a note four for like Christmas and with it came a free LG like V7, real crappy tablet with like an entry level like Snapdragon 430 or whatever it was. Like it was just a piece of crap and we don't use it. So, you know, I, I took over my my parents' financial situation because I'm in better standing now. And I'm looking at their AT&T bill. It's like $260 or something like wild. And I'm just like, why do we have a tablet on here? I, I didn't even know we had a tablet. Like I, that's how zero we use it. <laughs> like that's so, awful. So I went down to an AT&T store because I wanted to get that removed. And the first thing I was told is they can't remove it from me. I have to call this like one 800 number. You, let me it. wait, Dan. Let me just, I'm trying to understand here. So the store added the tablet mm -hmm. without probably explaining the implications of that. And you go back to the store and they're not able to remove the very tablet line they added. Is that correct? Right. So um, they couldn't remove this tablet line. They gave me this like 1-800, like AT&T number. I had to talk to them to get it removed. And while I'm waiting on hold, which is a nice 15 minute hold, true AT&T fashion, uh, the sales rep's talking to me about like the unlimited elite plan. Because I, I wasn't paying that much attention to like AT&T's phone plans, right? It wasn't on my mind. Um, but she she got my attention. She's telling me about these discounts that we would get because my dad was like a firefighter and you know, the auto pay discount and, and, you know, the perks, the hundred gigs of data, the HBO max. And like, it caught my attention. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get, I want to get that. Let me, let me get this tablet. I removed it and I'll, I'll do it with you. Cause I'm sure you get commission. So, you know, I get the, you know, I call in, I'm talking to this dude. He's like, yeah, I can remove the tablet for you. But he said, I have to wait till like the end of my bill cycle. No, so, like, geez. so I'm like, whatever, just do it. So I, I think that's all good. I'm great. So now I'm talking to the girl. We're getting my plan changed over. Unlimited Elite, you know, the good plan. And she's telling me that um, she's explaining to me how AT&T doesn't do, like, proration. Like, if I were to make the switch, like, today, I would get charged my full bill for, like, the old mobile uh, mobile value share plan on top of, like, the AT&T Unlimited plan. So I said, cool, line it up with the end of my bill cycle. So, like, no problems. Well, I guess her system has some, like, issue. And the change goes through. Oh, no on that day right so Wait, now so did this change your billing cycle to that day or did it just double charge you and keep the same billing cycle it keeps the it keeps the same billing cycle but i end up getting like like double no! charged no um, so like so now i have to call on the phone again wait another 15 minutes to talk to like a retention rep so they can put me back in this mobile value share plan Jeez. and I have to get like a credit and I get told I'm going to get a credit and like, you know, that's all good. And I said, all right, this seems good. And I'm already here anyway, like and for a penny and for a pound. I've been, mind you, I've been here for like an hour and a half at this point. Um, but I'm like, and for a penny and for a pound while I'm here, can you activate eSIM? Sure, that's, I that's reasonable, right? I shouldn't have asked. I oh, have. no. I was going to say, so I want to get Easton activated on my iPhone 11 um, because I was thinking about taking advantage of like the next time T Mobile does like a free line deal so I could have like a night, like, you know. Oh, that'd be sweet. Rocking it. Right? I mean, that's almost the optimal solution in the United States where you can get great coverage on one network. Anytime it doesn't have coverage, boom, you got great coverage on another network. So that would be sweet dennis so what happened you got eSIM. i'm assuming it was easy no no nothing about it was easy um first off I, we try to do this qr code i'm getting this weird error uh, we we try we try we try and i finally get it activated but i lose my freaking number my, what my phone number they I get lost your number yeah they activated me with like this new number and i lost my other one so then I had to do another phone call to get my phone properly provisioned with a proper SIM card, get my phone number back, which I'm glad they did, because I'm not going to lie, I if I couldn't get my phone number back, I probably would have just canceled AT&T at this point. But um, but no, I got my phone number back, always ran, and I'm just like, you know what? Forget the unlimited elite plan, forget everything. I'm just going to walk home, call it a day. But 
No, the story wasn't over. It took three months to get my billing strained out to get put over to the unlimited elite plan because I did I did want to do it because it would save me money. And I never did do the eSIM, and I'm never going to dabble with that again with AT&T. Like, I'm not risking losing my phone number because it's tied into so many things, like two-factor authentication for banks. But it was just a, a horrible experience. Like, AT&T's biller, terrible. Like, I never get to see the credits. And we had this conversation last night, right? Like, you get yeah, one thing, but it's something different. It was just so... It's really so bad. Scary. I signed up for an AT&T business plan, and I was explaining to you last night that when I got my first, they give you, at t gives you a preview of the bill. And that scared me so much because the first month was like $243, they said. And this was for their $70 plan. And then the recurring charges were like $130 to $140 a month. And I was like, oh my God, I can't do that. But I've seen so many posts on Reddit now that are like, yeah, at t billing is broken. broken. People are getting bills, not bills, but they're getting this like... uh bill preview or whatever it's called showing like $800 worth of charges per month. And then because of the discounts that are applied, uh, the bill actually comes out to something more reasonable, like 200 or $240 a month for their like five or six line plan or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's just a broken system. And it's and a shame. Yeah, it's so bad. I mean, because the service is good, right? But the the billing experience isn't as great. Like T-Mobile, great online account experience. I have a pretty good experience with Verizon. I find their website to be like oddly slow and chunky sometimes. Um, but yeah, compared to AT&T, it's just like a dinosaur. It's so bad. And, and it, it just really is a shame. Like like you said, like their cell phone service, like they know what they're doing. It's a good cell phone network. Like I would... Like, I have always said, like, Duopoly, AT&T and Verizon, they've always been, like, pretty even Stevens for the most part. I mean, you know, each has had their ups, right? Like, I'm, I'm sure you remember back in the 3G days, right? AT&T was king, especially when they had HSP+. Plus. You know, Verizon took over for a bit with LT, but now we're seeing AT&T is, like, as things end on the LT generation, like, AT&T came back on, on top thanks to the first net deal and different things. So, like, AT&T knows what they're doing from, like, a performance standpoint. Same thing with some of their other services too, like their their AT and T U verse for anybody that's had it. You know, Gigabit Fiber, it's great. Even even Direct TV, I, I hope I don't get shot. Even Direct TV, you know, I don't personally have it, but I've used it, and it's not a bad service for what it is. But their billing system and their just whole customer service situation is hands down the worst. And the I'm so glad that I don't have to talk to them often because it seems like anytime I have an interaction with them, it just ends with me being miserable. <laughs> and um, paying more. Paying for it. You're paying for your misery, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully, I don't call them very often. I mean, like, that was the first time I talked to them in the probably... The first and last. <laughs> yeah, like five years. It was, like, the first time I had to talk to them. So, I mean, it all worked out. I got the elite plan. I'm super happy with it. Like, it's really good. But man, that experience is just one that I will always talk about as like laughs. And it, it's just, man, left I don't know. It shook. Left me shook. But one, yeah. one very relevant comment here for the people tuning in on the YouTube live stream of this podcast episode is from Zach Yarborough. And he says, the bill preview is insane. I had a preview once for $750 a month. And in reality, it was like $160. So yeah, AT&T's billing system is broken and uh, it's unfortunate because their service is great. And instead of spending money on ads, I wish they would make a better website, better customer support experience. Just, yeah, just a better experience. All right. I think Dennis, to kind of conclude this epic episode of the first ever best phone plans podcast, I want to circle back to eSIM and I want to ask you a question. What is your ideal eSIM pairing for a dual SIM phone and would it be worth it if you lose access to 5G? So my ideal pairing would probably look like this. T-Mobile would be my main line and then as my backup I would probably pick some form of Verizon plan. Probably visible actually because it's cheaper, right? Yeah. Uh, Probably visible. Like that would be like my pairing, like T Mobile, Verizon with visible. Now, is it worth it if I lose 5G? Absolutely not. Um, 
and the reason why I said this or say this is because a lot of covers that T-Mobile is deploying right now with their band 71 low band is like exclusively on the 5G band. So if I forgo that, I lose coverage. And T-Mobile needs that right now. And also in the areas where T-Mobile's coverage is good, um, because there are some, um, 5G does make a difference. Same thing with my AT&T testing. 5G has been making a difference, not necessarily in like download performance, but on latency, it's been always lower and upload speed, which are two really useful things. Um, and that and that would and that would kind of be that. What about for you personally, Stetson? Yeah, this is a really great question. So I think my ultimate hack would probably be to do if you do T-Mobile prepaid on eSIM, you're getting, ironically, the postpaid data priority. So I think that's a great way to get unlimited data at postpaid priority. And I would consider pairing it with um, maybe another postpaid plan to really get maybe Verizon to really get that ultimate postpaid experience. Um, however, I think for me on a more budget standpoint, like if you look at, let's say T-Mobile Magenta, and I love using Magenta as an example because taxes and fees are included. So it comes out to just 70 bucks a month for that same $70. I could scoop up Mint Mobile's unlimited plan. So I'm getting 35 gigs of data. Let's, let's say I throw that on eSIM and I could pick up visible. So for the same $70 a month, visible includes taxes and fees. Mint Mobile doesn't, so maybe it'd be like 72 a month, 73 a month, but I'm getting unlimited data on Verizon and 35 gigs on T-Mobile. So I think that could be a pretty sweet pairing in comparison to spending 70 for just Magenta, or if I do a pairing of like T-Mobile with another plan, uh, that could easily be like 100 to 150 a month. I like it. And hey, Stetson, do you want to take this as a chance to answer some Patreon questions? Yeah, so uh, for the end of this podcast, we're going to answer some Patreon questions and uh, any of the Super Chats that come in on the YouTube live stream. So we actually had a great question from Patreon supporter and uh, Saif Munzi, I believe. Um, Two questions here, and they are regarding the QCI values on Verizon. So part one, something I want to confirm is, is Verizon business a higher priority than postpaid. And Dennis, I think you actually had the answer for this. So what was it? Uh, the answer is yes. Verizon's business lines are higher priority than postpaid. All right. And the second part of this question is, why is Verizon deprioritization QCI9 always so bad in congested areas? Uh, what's interesting is I actually uh, you know, did my visible review and uh, they're always on QCI9. So visible is always deprioritized. And the reason Verizon is so bad in congested areas is simply they don't have the uh, bandwidth to support it. They don't have the spectrum to support multiple uh, data connections. So they have limited available spectrum. And with a lot of users, there's there's literally nothing Verizon can do. Like the network just slows down uh, for everyone and even more so for the people who do happen to be deprioritized. Does you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean... To Stetson's point, yeah, Verizon has the most customers, right? And they have the least amount of spectrum out of all the major carriers at the moment. Um, so there's not much they can really do. I mean, QC, I mean, they're they're just really strict with their network management, and QCI9 is the bottom of the barrel. You know, they're they're throttling you first and the hardest to make sure that the people that are paying more, you know, are able to have like a usable connection. And, you know, Verizon, you know, they invest billions every year to try to improve things and you know hopefully this will get resolved here shortly once they get some more spectrum from the auction but in the meantime yeah it just is what it is for the moment um if it is a market where Verizon isn't very strong for you um it might be worth looking into other options um yeah i think so- that's kind of what you said earlier it's basically you want to get a plan where you have coverage <laughs> so that's you know that's a uh... That's what we want to start with. If a plan isn't working, just go ahead and switch it. Like you, you are free to do that uh, as long as you're not locked into any like financing agreement or anything like that. We do have a couple of super chats which I want to take some time to shout out and appreciate. Anthony Johnson, thank you so much, my friend, for your super chat. He says, "Thanks for the content, my dude. I appreciate it. I use Verizon and Sprint as my pairing for dual SIM. I think that's a great pairing, uh, especially since Sprint is using the T-Mobile network now." Um, so yeah, great options. You're getting 
great coverage and performance on Verizon. And honestly, I've had really good experiences on Sprint slash T-Mobile in my area. So I think that's a that's a really good combination. And I also want to, I realized I never talked about this for my answer, but I, at the current state, am easily willing to forego 5G support because in my area, 5G speeds are noticeably slower than LTE in my personal area. All right, we got another super chat from Breaking Data. Breaking Data, thank you so much for your support, my friend. I really appreciate you. Keep up the good work, he says. I'm excited to hear that, and I can't wait to continue the Best Phone Plans podcast. Finally, Joey Okazaki, thank you so much for the super sticker, my friend. He says, keep it up, and we have a weightlifting emoji, so I really appreciate that. All right, everyone, thank you for tuning in to the first ever episode of the Best Phone Plans podcast. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube, youtube.com slash Stetson Doggett, to stay tuned with the latest cell phone plans and videos. Uh, if you want to leave a comment on the YouTube live stream of what you thought of the first episode of the podcast, I welcome your feedback and appreciate your ongoing support. And if you're listening to this on the available streaming platforms, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcasts, uh, feel free to check out the YouTube channel if you want to tune into a live episode of the podcast recording. Or uh, yeah, thank you so much for listening either way. And that's going to be it. Thank you, everyone who came to join. I want to give a shout out to Dennis, my co-host. Dennis, it was great having you on this episode, and I can't wait to do another episode with you. And uh, yeah, Dennis, any any concluding words? Uh, Stetson, you should tell him about your Visible promo before we go. Oh, Dennis, this is why you're here, my friend. Uh, guys, Visible is doing a promo right now. Link in the video description and in the show notes if you're listening on the podcast. You can get your first month for three bucks. That's $3 for one month of true unlimited data on the Verizon network. And you can experience what the deprioritization is like because Visible is deprioritized. And this is a great opportunity. Try them out. Um, I believe you will need to use a physical SIM card for this. And I believe uh, it's going on for at least this month, at least for now. So hit the link in the description if you're interested. Three bucks, test out the Verizon network, test out Visible. And that is it. I guess one final question. How come iPhones don't support 5G on eSIM? They do support 5G on eSIM. It's only when your iPhone is in dual SIM mode that 5G isn't supported. So that's an important point of clarification. And I believe Apple is working on an update to make that available soon. All right, that is actually going to be it. Thank you all who joined. Thank you for listening. Rate us on the podcast.